Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us. And today we're right back in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. We finished it last week, but it ends with Christ's great commission to all believers everywhere. And wrapped up in His great commission are the Christians' rights and responsibilities. In today's lecture, we will break this great commission down and we will find out what our duties are and the authority that we have in the name of Jesus and why we anoint with oil and why we were told to lay hands on the sick and then they will recover. <clears throat> and we will begin in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Uh, and uh, so, and, and it reads, which Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 is Jesus speaking to His followers just moments before His ascension back into heaven. Verse 15, And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the gospel is the good news that through Christ's sacrifice on the cross and His resurrection from the dead, mankind has been redeemed from sin, sickness, disease, poverty, and death. And that is good news. And that anyone who accepts His sacrifice, His Lordship, and adheres to His teachings has been promised favor with God in this life and in the life to come, everlasting life with our Father and the Son. This is the message that you and I are to take to the whole world. All right? Verse 16, And he that believeth Believeth what? That's obvious. The gospel. And is baptized shall be saved. Now look at that word saved. <clears throat> in the Greek, it's sozo. S-O-Z-O in the English. And sozo means delivered, protected, healed, and preserved. All in one word. And he said, He that believeth the gospel and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And, and what are we to be baptized in? Two things. The water, all right, first, and then the Spirit. And for all those that hear and understand the Gospel with clarity, I mean, you have to understand it, and then choose not to believe, they are the ones who shall be damned. And the word damned in the Greek in the manuscripts is katakrino. What does it mean? Catacrino means that at some point, right at the end of the millennium, they will be judged, condemned, and sentenced. And what is that sentence? Well, it's eternal death. Well, what's eternal death? It's the death of the soul. You see, they've already died, the flesh death. And if they don't pick it up by the end of the millennium, their, their soul's going to die too. And Bible calls the death of the soul, it calls it, the second death. You die in the flesh. If you don't pass the test at the end of the millennium, your, all, your soul is also going to die. It's going to be as though it never existed. Verse 17. And these signs, listen closely, believers, these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Shall they speak with new tongues. Stop right there. Tongues in the Greek manuscripts means languages. In other words, they will speak in different known languages of the world that they had not previously learned, which is a logistic miracle that did take place on the Feast of Pentecost, the day that God poured out His Holy Spirit on all flesh, Acts chapter 2. And the early apostles would need this gift. Think about it. Jesus has just told them all to go into the world and preach the gospel. And so they'll need this gift as they take the gospel to all the different foreign nations of the world. And those 11, before they were brutally killed by the Kenites, did take that gospel and it got as far as Great Britain. All across Asia Minor, all of Europe, and all clear into Britain. It's a proven fact. So, now, in Acts chapter 10, and you need to go back and read this, all right? Acts chapter 10, 
will give you a clear example of just that, of what Christ has just said. You should read it. Verse 18, Jesus said, They shall take up serpents. Now that don't mean snakes. You know, we don't need no snake handlers, okay? <clears throat> I'll explain. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and you're sitting at home, but repeat it with me. And they shall recover. I'm going to read it again. They shall lay hands on the sick. Talking about the believers. Okay? Say it with me. And they shall recover. Period. And these are all signs that the person who is bringing forth the gospel is a true believer in the risen Christ. And these signs that follow them are their credentials. These signs that follow us are our credentials. We don't need any paper. The signs prove it. So expect them to follow you. And today I want, to, I want us to focus on why Jesus told us to use His name and why He told us to anoint with oil and why He told us to lay hands on the sick. Now, Mark 16, 15 through 18 is the only text I will have you turn to for the rest of this message. Because I have nine, <clears throat> excuse me, 19 other scriptures that I will read. And for time's sake, write these scriptures down, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because they are your Bible roadmap to healing. You need healed? This is the roadmap you follow. When I'm finished with this lecture, you can take this list, you can walk through your Bible, and you'll see what it's all going to say, because I'm going to hit every single one of them. You need to build your faith up if you want to be healed. <clears throat> and so let's begin <clears throat> with the name of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, Jesus told His followers, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents, and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, he said, shall by any means hurt you. And although the word power is used twice in this verse, two different words <clears throat> are found in the original manuscripts. The first word power in the Greek is exousia. And it means authority and jurisdiction. Like a cop has authority, if he's standing in the middle of a four-way intersection, the lights are out, the, the traffic lights are out, and they move a cop out, and he's going, stop, go, go, stop. He has jurisdiction, and he has authority of the whole city, and if that don't get it, the whole county, if that don't get it, the state's behind him, if that don't get it, the feds will. That's the kind of authority that that cop has. Well, you've got the same type of authority in the name of Jesus. Exousia means authority and jurisdiction. And this second word power in the Greek is not the same word as exousia. This one is dunamis. All right? It's where we get our word dynamite. And it does mean power or force. So what Jesus actually said was, if you break it down to the manuscripts, He said, I have given you, my followers, authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. In speaking about serpents and scorpions, Jesus is talking about having power over the devil, demons, and evil spirits. Not snakes and scorpions. He's referring this to the devil, demons, and evil spirits. And we need to realize as believers that we do... Listen to me. I'm running into this a lot with people being afraid. Afraid to go in a house. I'm afraid it's haunted. The door's closed. I don't doubt it. I know that I know spirits do crazy things. You know, the, she, the, the, the curtains move. There ain't no wind. You know what I mean? But let me tell you something. You, Jesus has given you authority over demons, the devil, and evil spirits. So you need to realize, okay... You need to realize that we as believers do 
have authority over them in the name of Jesus. If you run into something like that, you tell it to get in the name of Jesus. It's got to go. And that God Himself, okay, is the power behind our authority. Just like the cop goes clear back to the federal government if he needs it, the power behind our authority is God Almighty. And, though, and they must obey your authority when you speak. Because authority is what? It's delegated power. It's been passed down to you. In other words, Jesus has given us power, get this, to act in His stead. You see, He left. He said, I'm coming back. Well, I'm gone. I'm going to give you this power in my stead. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 10, God also has given Him, Jesus, a name which is far above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow <clears throat> of things in heaven. That's all the angels. And things in the earth. That's all the folks. That's all the people. And things under the earth. And that's all the demons. So beings in all three worlds must bow at the name of Jesus. They have no choice. They don't. God can wipe them out right there. They will be no more. <clears throat> so <clears throat> according to Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, <clears throat> Christ has transferred the authority in His name, the name of Jesus, to all His believers. So the question is, do you believe? That's the question. <clears throat> and I know, I know that most of you do. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, Peter said to a crippled man, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man walked. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 18, Paul said to a demon, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the insane woman was perfectly restored. <clears throat> Jesus left His name with us. And we have been given the right to use it. And the believer that's praying for the sick or those who need deliverance needs to know, they need to understand, and they need to believe that in the name of Jesus lies your authority. Don't forget to use it. You're powerless without it. And what about the person who is sick? and comes up to be prayed for. What does that person need to know? See, it ain't, it's a two-way street here. We're going to be talking about healing here. <clears throat> what does the person that's coming up, you have a prayer line. We're going to have a prayer line next week. What does that person need to know that comes up to, that wants to be prayed for? What do they need to know? That person needs to know this. If you are sick, God wants to heal you. Period. No ifs, no ands, and no buts. Because healing is for everyone. Not just the few. Mm -mm, no way, no way. The greatest barrier to faith. I've been in this a long time. The greatest barrier to faith of many who seek healing is the uncertainty in their minds as to it being the will of God to heal everyone. Nearly everyone knows that God does heal some, but they think, but will He heal me? I've been there. When I was a young man, I've been there. Okay, It is virtually impossible, listen closely, to boldly claim by faith a blessing which we are not sure God offers because the blessings of God cannot be, or can be claimed only where the will of God is known. Does that make sense? Trusted and acted upon 
In other words, you got to believe if you want to receive. All right? The word testament, you got a New Testament, you got an Old Testament. The word testament describes <clears throat> a person's written will after death. That's what it means. And the Bible contains God's last will and testament. Mostly the New Testament. The Bible contains God's last will and testament that He left to us, His children, in which He bequeaths to all of us, every one of us, the blessings of redemption. Okay. So if you want to know what He left to us, you have to read the will. All right. In other words, you have to read the Bible. Now, you may not have to read it, but you have to hear it. And that's what I do. You know, I'm a blabbermouth, I understand, but God gave me a, a gift to teach, and so maybe you can't read, or maybe you can't see to read yet. All right? But if you tune in to Dove Point, I'll give you enough scripture every week. I guarantee you there's hours and hours of research behind it. You just stick with us. I'll give you chapter and verse. I'll keep subject and object in place. And when we get done, you'll know that book. Amen. That's what we're about. <clears throat> and his will, and in his will, in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 25, we read it last week. Uh, uh, forgiving, and it's forgiven the first fruits offering. That's where I got it from. Exodus 23, 25 says, God says, I will take sickness away from you and the number of your days I will fulfill. That's a promise from God, friend. In, in Exodus 15, 26, God said, I am the Lord God who heals you. In Luke 4, verse 40, says that Jesus, get this, laid His hands on every one of them and healed them all. And right here, he was revealing the will of God for all people. He demonstrated by God's will by healing them all. They wanted, they all wanted it. They all got it. It was at a mass meeting. It was one of those big meetings. Jesus said in John 6 38, he said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, uh uh, but the will of him that sent me. So when you see Jesus' will, you're looking at Daddy's will. All right? That's, that's what he said. And everything Jesus did for man was a direct revelation of the perfect will of God for man. So, don't come for healing with this faith-destroying phrase. If it be your will... Don't come up for prayer with that faith-destroying phrase. I'm going to say it again. If it be your will, God. <laughs> now, there are some prayers that require if it be your will, but not healing. Among all those that sought healing from Jesus during His earthly ministry, there is only one time and only one person in the entire New Testament who asked for healing with the words, if it be your will. And we studied it, and it was in Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. And this man was an outcast leper, all right, in Luke 1 40, who did not know, think about this, he did not know what Christ's will was in healing. But look at what happened. And kneeling down to Jesus, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Ooh, and Jesus answered, I will. Be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from the man, and he was cleansed. That's the will of God for healing. So, Settle it forever in your minds, ladies and gentlemen. God will heal the sick. He wants to. If He wills to heal one, then He wills to heal all. Glory to God. Let's take a little time break, shall we? Hallelujah. i got to preach on me, but I'm rolling here, so 
Stay with me. You need healing. You're in the right house tonight. Ready? The came to life. Mm -mm -mm. <clears throat> Ain't nothing like water when you're thirsty. Amen. I'm going to do me another one. Here we go. Second Peter 3 9. I can prove to you that it's God's will to heal you, that you fulfill the days of your life. Because 2 Peter 3 9 says, Peter says, God is not willing that any should perish. He don't want you dying of some sickness before you fulfill your life's call. That's not what he wants. God is not willing that any should perish before that. Every believer has the right to healing as well as forgiveness when they what? When they believe. That's, that's all it takes. Matthew 14 and verse 36. Now see, when I'm all done with this, you'll have parts of it in your memory and some of it will get past it past you, but you can go back through this tomorrow or the next day. You're wanting to be healed. I'd read them every single day till I got my faith up because you can walk out of there healed. Matthew 14, 36, as many as touched Jesus were made perfectly whole. Woo, he didn't even touch them. They just wanted to come up and touch Him. Bam! Perfectly whole. Luke 6, 19, the whole multitude sought to touch Jesus and He healed them all. Glory to God. Healing is part of the Gospel and is to be preached throughout all the world and to every creature. Just as salvation is. Think about it. But do you hear much about it? Not really. But you should. Being part of the Gospel. Healing being part of the Gospel. The divine blessing of physical healing is for everyone. Christ first commissioned 12 disciples to heal. He sent them out two by two. Later, He commissioned the 70. Sent them out to heal. And finally, that same commission was given to all who believe. It was given to the church. And these commissions have never been revoked. They're still in effect. Now, Whenever you don't know the will of God in something, and this happens, okay, in any matter, we may pray in faith that God will do this or that for us if it be His will. That's a correct prayer. And He will do what is best when you pray that way for you. And that's fine. That's what you want in that case. But where God has revealed His will by promising to do a certain thing for everyone, we need not be in ignorance of it or in doubt concerning that thing. Zero. Forget the doubt. Throw it out. And I can tell you why more people don't get healed than do. It is simply because of the lack of teaching and preaching the Bible truth about healing. Think about it right real good. Now well, listen to this next statement. We don't tolerate sin in our lives. Why? Because we've had it pounded in our head that Jesus bore our sins. Nobody can take your salvation away from you. You're saved and somebody tries to tell you you're not, you'll say you're crazy or you'll face fight them or whatever has to happen. They'll never get you off of your salvation. You know why? Preach week after week after week. And you believe and you are saved. Neither do we need to tolerate sickness in our bodies because Jesus also bore our sicknesses just exactly as He bore our sins. Matthew 8, 17. Himself, Jesus, took our infirmities, that's our weaknesses, and bore our sicknesses. Right there it is. Which includes all diseases. Heart disease, lung disease, brain disease, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, it don't matter. It covers it all. If you got faith. Isaiah 53, 4. The prophet writes, surely He, talking about the Messiah, Jesus, has borne, which means carried away our sorrows, get this, and our pains. 
And by these scriptures, we know that Jesus bore our sicknesses just as He bore our sins. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who His own self bear our sins in His own body on the tree by whose stripes you were healed. Past tense. What do you mean past tense? Yeah, it was paid for right there on the cross. Paid in full. The Gospel very clearly shows that Jesus Christ bore our sins and our sicknesses. And that means He carried them away. Hallelujah. And therefore, we are redeemed from them. So, we need never to bear them. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. In James chapter 5 and verse 14, the Apostle tells us, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him <clears throat> with oil in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. Verse 15, And the prayer of faith <clears throat> shall save, all right, same word, sozo, shall heal and deliver <clears throat> and preserve. And that same word, and the prayer of faith shall heal the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Now that's important. In Mark 16, verse 13, when Jesus sent out the twelve two by two, it says, they cast out devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. He sent the disciples out early with olive oil, with the healing oil. <clears throat> and the oil we are to use is the pure virgin olive oil. Amen. And the word olive in the Greek language, oddly enough, not really oddly, I'm sure it's on purpose, is el Eyal. <laughs> the two sacred names of God, El Shaddai and Yahovah. When you put that oil on you, that's what it's saying. And the prayer of, of the anointing with olive oil is laced throughout the entire Bible. Why? Because there is a symbolic relationship between the olive tree and God's people. He set it up that way. It was one of their staples in life. It was used for food. It was used in cooking. The oil was. It was used for medicinal purposes. And yes, there is a relationship even with our Messiah Jesus. The word Christ, Christos in the Greek means the anointed one. Glory to God. And He is, let me tell you. And whenever you anoint anything, something with oil, it means you are setting it aside for the use and for the work of Almighty God. Hallelujah. In Israel, the kings and the prophets and the priest were all anointed with the oil of God's family. Pure virgin olive oil. Also, certain objects were anointed. All right? For the use of God all through the Bible. Moses anointed the tabernacle in the wilderness when it was finished, along with all the furniture inside the tabernacle and the altar. Also, the daily sacrifice was cooked, you guessed it, in olive oil. This was all done, listen closely, at the command of the Almighty. It wasn't just a good idea. He said, do it this way. And they did it that way. And currently. And many times, all right, God uses a natural material thing. He does it all the time. It's a spiritual book, the Bible. He uses a natural material thing to explain a much more powerful spiritual thing. You've got to catch the spiritual off of it. And here's what you need to know about this natural material anointing with oil that He told us to do. The healing of the sick and the exorcism of evil spirits were not 
do to the oil itself. The oil of itself has no spiritual power in it at all, okay? The oil is only symbolic, all right? The oil represents the miraculous power and operation of God's Holy Spirit. Understand, the Holy Spirit is a person, okay? He's not a bird. He's not the air, all right? He's a person. He is the third head of the beautiful Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when you get born again, you get saved, you get sozoed, He comes to live in you. It changes your life. And even though we know that the anointing with oil is symbolism, it's okay. We do it not only because it represents the power of the Holy Spirit, but we do it out of obedience because He told us to do it. Very important. And when you do what God tells you to do, it's an act of faith, and man, does it please God. And when you please Him, look out. He knows how to take care and please you too. I'm telling you right now. And that's on the ministry side of things. Let's take another Lachaim break. Are you enjoying this? I know I'm going through it. You may have to go back and listen to it. Am I going too fast? Okay. Let's take a Lachaim. Lachaim to life. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And that's on the ministry side of things. But, for the person who's being anointed and prayed for, because they need healing, there'll be many come up next week. They'll need it. James said, the Apostle James, but let that person ask in faith, the one that's getting prayed for, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. Let not that man or that woman think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Woo! So it's faith going in, coming, in, coming at you, and it's faith inside you. <clears throat> so when you come up for prayer, it's your faith that activates the healing power of God. You've got to believe. That's why I'm bringing these, these scriptures. And for the one who's doing the praying, we are told in the Great Commission that any believer can lay hands on the sick and they, and they the sick, shall recover. And a true believer is one who acts on the Word of God. That's why Terry and I will be using oil next Sunday. Okay? And laying hands on whatever the sick or where you need deliverance, it doesn't matter. And I'll tell you why a true believer is one who acts on the Word of God. Because God never tells us to do something that we cannot do. That's why. Listen closely. Obtaining the fulfillment of His promise listen real close, is more a matter of obedience than of conscious faith. Oh, i got to have faith. i got to have faith. No, listen to me. Let me say it again. Obtaining the fulfillment of His promise is more a matter of doing what He said, obedience, than of conscious faith. And here is what faith is, and this will be the best explanation you've ever heard in your life. Faith is doing what God tells us to do, and then expecting God to do what He tells us He will do. I'm going to repeat it again. That's a definition of faith. That's the best one you'll ever get because that is the true blue stuff. Faith is doing what God tells us to do. That's why I'll have oil on my hand and my wife will have oil on her hand. That's why I'll lay hands on you and pray for you, and she'll lay hands on you and pray for you. Because faith, all right, is doing what God tells us to do, and then we do something else. We expect God to do what He tells us He will do. That's on our end of it. That's faith. Noah, build an ark. God flooded the earth. Moses, Stretched out a rod, God parted the waters. Joshua, 
They were doing this all at the command of God. Marched around the walls of Jericho. God pushed them down. Mm -mm -mm. Elijah smote the waters of the Jordan River. God parted the waters. Nahum dipped seven times in the muddy Jordan. God healed the leprosy. Elisha threw a stick in the river and God made the iron axe head to float that was lost. Made it to swim. Jesus said, it is the believer who may lay hands on the sick. It is God who will make them well. Hallelujah. Kind of takes the pressure off, doesn't it? It really does. James said that the believers may anoint any, any of the sick with oil and pray the prayer of faith on their behalf. All right? But it is the Lord who shall raise up the sick. God said, you do a small thing, I'll do a large thing. You do a foolish thing, and I'll do a wise thing. You do something that only a human can do, and I'll do something that, on, that I, God, can do. Only, he, only I can do it. Mm -mm. Do what God tells you to do. Then expect God to do what He said He will do. That's faith. Glory to give Him praise right now. He's sitting in your home. Give Him praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. I suggest from now on, when you read the New Testament, read it as though you have never read it before in your entire life and believe every. Thing you read. The Bible records many incidences of faith in the laying on of hands. In Mark 5, in verse 23, we covered it when we did Mark. When Jairus came to Jesus and said, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray you, come and lay your hands on her and she shall live. Did he have faith? Oh, he had it. Jesus went and took the damsel by the hand and said to her, Arise! And she arose. Faith coming and going. In Luke 13, verses 11 through 13, Jesus saw a woman bowed over with a spirit of infirmity. And He laid His hands on her. And immediately, she was made straight and glorified God. Listen real close right here. Let me build up your self-esteem in the Word, okay? <clears throat> if you are a believer, the nature of God is in you. And the Spirit of God dwells in you as His temple. So the power of God is in you. Do you understand that? I'm going to say it one more time. If you're a believer, the nature of God is in you. And the Spirit of God is in you. It dwells in you as His temple. So, the power of God is in you. And it is this power of the Almighty who heals the sick. Hallelujah. It ain't you. It ain't me. It's Him. When hands are laid on them, in Jesus' name. So, for the sick, all right, the laying on of hands, here's what it does. It helps them to release their faith, not, not in the person who's praying, but in the Word of God. We'll read it again. So, for the sick, the laying on of hands helps them to release their faith in the Word of God. It's kind of like a car battery is dead and you got a good battery and you got jumper cables and you put the jumper cables on the dead battery and you help them get started. That's what laying on the hands does. And sometimes, listen to this. What I'm about to tell you is like 40 years of experience, okay? <clears throat> sometimes, healing is accomplished by manifestations. Sometimes. I didn't say all the time. You may feel, when you get prayed for, get healed, the life of God Pouring through your body, making it whole. 
At other times, you may feel absolutely nothing. And it makes no difference whether or not you have a feeling. The Word of God is far superior to your feelings. It is written, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The Word is always true. And whether feelings come or not, healing always comes. You understand that? One may be healed by the power of God, never feel anything, just as healed. Others may feel a great surge of God's healing power. They may feel a heat or a shock like a current of electricity. But take my advice. I've been around a couple of days. Do not expect feelings. Expect healing. Healing is always better than feeling. Faith has nothing to do with feelings. And feelings has nothing to do with faith. You understand that? Faith always attributes everything to what the Word of God says irrespective of any pains or symptoms or feelings you may have. All right? Let's say you come up for prayer with your faith based on the Word of God and instead of feelings. That's good. And you're ministered to according to the Scriptures by the laying on of hands and you are anointed with oil. And then someone asks you, well, how do you feel? <laughs> this always happens. Your answer should be, I am healed because the Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But a few days later, a person, maybe the same person, asks again, do you feel any better? It happens. Your word back to them is, I know I'm healed because it is written, by His stripes I am healed. And God said, I am the Lord who heals you, and that means me. You understand? Irregardless of any aches or pains that you may feel. You see, the work has already been done. It's already paid for. Because you attributed your healing to the power and the authority and the faithfulness of the Word of God. Not feelings. So, after you've been prayed for, if someone asks you, well, how do you feel? You don't have to lie. You should always be honest. Okay? You don't have to lie. Neither should you ignore your aches and pains. If you've got them, you've got them. But here's the secret. I'm going to tell you how to answer it. Always answer with the Word of God. You ain't lied. You ain't making nothing up. You ain't pretending. Always answer with the Word of God. Just say exactly what the Bible says. By His stripes, we are healed. They laid hands on me, and I shall recover. Jesus said it, and He cannot lie. Hallelujah. That's what you say, or something to that effect. Sometimes. Healing comes immediately. Listen close. And sometimes you have to use your faith and put actions to it and just walk it out. Bam. I've been healed both ways. I can tell you right now, I've been healed more ways by walking it out than I have been immediately, but I do know that both of them exist. And that's up to the Father. Okay, But either way, you're healed when you believe the Word of God. If you are currently under a doctor's care, that's great. Thank God for doctors and medicine and technology. One of Christ's twelve disciples <clears throat> was a medical doctor, Dr. Luke. And if you haven't done it already, you're working with a doc, thank God. Do yourself and your doctor a favor and add your faith to what they're helping you with right now 
and walk out of that physical malady in record time and then give God the praise. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of God. I thank you, Father, for my healing and my health. Hallelujah. If there's someone right now, you want it right now. You just stretch your hand toward that television set or your phone or whatever you're holding. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, be healed of that physical malady. Now give God praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you take it to heart. But don't forget, we're having our Dove Point Fall Fellowship on Sunday, October the 1st year of our Lord 2023. And we would love to have you come and join with us. We really would, if you can make it. We will meet at the Miner's Day Building, 703 Dawson Drive, King Jack Park, Web City, Missouri, <clears throat> 64870. And by the way, October the 1st is the second day of the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles, which runs for seven days. We'll be right in the Feast of Tabernacles when I bring you the message, the Feast of Tabernacles and the Kingdom Wedding. Woo You're going to like that one. Fellowship starts at 10 a.m. Refreshments will be served. At 11 o'clock, I will bring a lecture entitled, I just told you, the Feast of Tabernacles and the Kingdom Wedding. Following the lecture, there will be a communion service. And following communion, there will be a prayer line for all those who want prayer. We will be anointing with oil and laying hands on the sick. And if you need a healing touch in your body, be there. And come expecting something good to happen to you. And you might want to listen to this lecture again so that you'll have your faith all built up. I promise you, we'll have, it, we'll have it ready on our end. And we'll be ready to go. You get ready to go and some really good things are going to happen. Amen. We, now, <clears throat> so from all of us here at Dub Point, we do sincerely hope that you can come to our fall fellowship. And for all those who can't make it, all right, can't make the fall fellowship, uh, it'll be on YouTube. Okay, I know some of you live on both coasts and both borders. I know you can't make it. But Ralph will have it on YouTube and you'll be able to get it. <clears throat> and, and like I said, well, you don't want to miss this lecture. This one is hot off the press, let me tell you. And uh, if you'd like a feast day's flow chart. I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to do a real quick synopsis of all seven next Sunday you would like a feast day's flow chart to make the feast days easier to understand because in Christendom we weren't taught these things. Now we teach them here at Dove Point, but they're a real thing and it shows the things that Christ would fulfill when he gets here. So if you'd like a feast day flow chart uh, to make the feast days easier to understand, just send your request to this address and Terry will get them right out to you and all of our literature is absolutely free. So we love you all. We thank you for watching. And until next time, my friends, shalom and shalom.